Good morning, everyone. Today, it's our pleasure to have Professor Dan Costello from University of Notre Dame visiting us. Professor Costello is actually originally from here, Seattle. He got his PhD from Notre Dame, and then later he became a professor at Notre Dame. Also spent 10 years working as the department chair over there. Dr. Costello received many awards, including the IEEE Third Millennium Medal, and he also got IEEE Think Prize for Outstanding Survey Paper. And Dr. Costello wrote uh, his research interests focus on digital communications, especially error correcting coding. He wrote numerous uh, technical papers, including many very good papers on convolutional LDPC code recently. And today, today he's going to talk about the genesis of coding theory. Okay. Thank you very much, Shin Miao. Since you mentioned that uh, award that I'd won, the Fink Award, I have to tell the, the story. This is the, the Donald G. Fink Prize Paper Award, IEEE. And our crack publicity department at Notre Dame, when I won, won this award, they put out a press release and says, Costello wins Fink Award. So I said, you got to change that, OK? <laughs> So anyway, as Jin Miao said, uh, uh, I grew up. I grew up over here on 43rd Avenue Northeast, and I went to Seattle Prep School right up here on Capitol Hill. I got my bachelor's degree from Seattle University down here near downtown in 1964. My mother actually worked here at the university for about 20 years in the in the. Uh, uh, 50s and 60s, I was a big Husky football fan. I'd go to all the games and in, the, in the 50s and early 60s before I left to go back to Notre Dame for graduate school, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, even went to the Husky basketball games and things like this. So I feel like a little bit like it's coming back home. I really appreciate Jin Miao for inviting me out here. I think everybody here is too young to remember uh, Daniel Dow, who was chair of the department in the 60s and 70s, I think, and when I got my PhD from Notre Dame, this is the first place I wanted to come to teach at the UW and talk to Dan Dow for off and on for several months until they f the, the, there was just no position available. I wound up at IIT in Chicago for a number of years and then went back to Notre Dame in 1985. But even then, some of you may remember Jim Medich, who was uh, chair of the department here then later in the 80s, I think. And Jim called me in 1984 as he was stepping down from being department chair and uh, wondering if I would be interested in throwing my name into the hat as a potential chair here, which I wasn't interested in doing. We were settled in the Midwest at that time, and that's actually the time I, I moved on to Notre Dame. So I, so I do feel. I have a lot of, uh, still have a lot of fond memories of Seattle and a lot of good friends out here and everything. So the, uh, the title of my talk is The Genesis of Coding Theory, and it's not going to tax anybody's brains today. I mean, this is, this is uh, just kind of a review of all the major advances in coding theory that have been made, and, and it's channel coding. I know coding means different things to different people. I'm not talking cryptography here. I'm not even talking source coding. I'm just talking channel coding. And coding means different things to different people. And, and uh, so, so we are talking about channel coding. But I kind of break this up into, uh, some people refer to this as, as my talk on the seven days of creation. I give it this Genesis title. And, and of course, being at, at Notre Dame, I can get away with this, with giving a talk that has a kind of a biblical connotation. And I even noticed that it, it happens that today, November 1st, is All Saints Day. So that even gives me more credibility here on this particular topic. So let's, let's move ahead. So in the beginning, of course, uh, most of you, uh, I hope, have heard of Claude Shannon, who is the founder of the field of information theory. And uh, kind of focusing throughout the talk on how this field of information theory in general, in particular uh, channel coding, has impacted uh, reliability on the additive white Gaussian noise channel. I mean, that, that's the standard channel 
model that people use, very prevalent, also very commonly observed in practice, additive Gaussian noise. So, and most of the advances in coding theory over the years have been made with reference to this channel model. So this is, uh, this is kind of the picture that we have. And on the uh, here we have power efficiency signal to noise ratio represented in terms of uh, EB over N0 energy per bit to noise power spectral density single sided expressed in decibels normally. And in the uh, vertical axis we have bandwidth efficiency. And this can be normalized in several ways. Those of you that work in communications uh, may, uh, would know this. In this particular talk, we normalize bandwidth efficiency, the number of information bits transmitted per two-dimensional signal, so like QPSK or 8PSK or something like this. So for example, uncoded 8PSK uh, would transmit, would have a bandwidth efficiency of 3 bits per, si for, per signal, and 16 QAM would have a bandwidth efficiency of 4 bits per signal. Okay, so Shannon's uh, capacity theorem basically gives a bound on the uh, channel quality, the signal to noise ratio, for which there is guaranteed to exist a code that can achieve arbitrarily reliable communication. And for the AWGN channel, this bound is, can be expressed this way. Otherwise, the signal to noise ratio uh, must be greater than this function of the bandwidth efficiency, and that's the curve that's plotted here, in order to be able to, in principle, guarantee reliable communication. So you can look at this as any combination of power efficiency and bandwidth efficiency to the right of this bound is possible. And for those of you that have studied information theory, you know that there's a converse to the theorem that says any point over here is not possible. Otherwise, any combination of power efficiency and bandwidth efficiency over here, it's not possible to achieve arbitrarily reliable communication. So that was uh, Shannon's great breakthrough in 1948. And you can also, now, the, the proof of his result uh, allows you to choose any signaling scheme that you want to, kind of any kind of modulation that you want to. And in practice, lots of times, the modulation scheme is, is fixed. Uh, we may just want to use BPSK modulation or 8PSK modulation or something like this. So you can, you can, you can derive... Uh, equivalent bounds, whenever you pick a particular type of modulation, you're constraining the system design a little bit. So you can, uh, you, you get a, a weaker bound if you constrain the modulation. Uh, but oftentimes you need to do that in practice anyway. So for example, if you constrain yourself for, with BPSK or what's equivalent in terms of two-dimensional signaling, QPSK, uh, you get this bound which means you can't go above two bits per signal with BPSK or QPSK. But you can see that this, at, the, at the lower bandwidth efficiencies, at the lower rates, uh, this is indistinguishable from, from the capacity bound. Okay, so uh, this is something different called a cutoff rate bound, this, this uh, dotted line, which is something that for a long time people felt was the practical limit. You, otherwise, Shannon said you could do this, but say this well, uh, but in practice you could only do this well because of practical constraints. And in, in recent years we found out that that is not the case. Uh, and this is the cutoff rate bound is again a, a function of the bandwidth efficiency, a different function, a, a, a weaker function. So, uh, in 1948, when Shannon first did his work before coding, th this is more or less what could be achieved. And uh, we have to, uh, and I think I have a pop-up here, yeah. We, we have to say, oh, what, what do we mean by reliable? Well, for, for lots of applications, 10 to the minus 5 bit error rate is considered reliable. Okay, so if we said, all right, what would we... What kind of reliability or, or what kind of signal to noise ratio would we need 
to get a 10 to the minus 5 error probability, say using just BPSK modulation, no coding before the days of channel coding, uh, the answer would be, well, it's 9.6 dB. And Shannon said we should be able to get that reliability at a much lower power of around uh, 1.8 dB. So there's this gap between what is achievable without coding and what in principle should be achievable with coding. And no matter what modulation scheme you're going to choose, there's, there's a big gap of the order of 5 to 10 dB between what can be done without coding and what in principle could be done with coding. So this is what people have focused on over the years, uh, the 60 plus years since Shannon's work. So I, I actually have the numbers here like uncoded 8 PSK is, requires 13.2 dB to achieve this 10 to the minus 5 bit error rate. So, but according to Shannon, we should be able to do that with something, uh, no, here we are here, with something around 3 dB. So there's about a 10 dB gap. And a dB means a lot in many applications. Uh, it, it, way, way back in the beginning, in the early days, at least in the early days of my work, we used to talk about in, in a lot of the applications were in space or satellite communication. Now, of course, they're pretty ubiquitous, but we talk about a dB would be worth maybe a million dollars in terms of system design. So, and, and that would be in the 1960s. So, so clearly uh, a dB is a significant amount in many practical applications. Okay, also, so one thing I want to point out, I'm not going to dwell on it too much, what if 10 to the minus 5 isn't considered reliable by by you or somebody else. And I, it, it reminds me of a, uh, a story. I, we used to do a lot of work for NASA, designing codes for NASA and things like that. I'd, I'd ask the, uh, the NASA contract monitor, and he'd say, well, we need a code to, to do this or that or the other thing. And, uh, and I'd say, well, what, uh, what error rate do you want us to design the code for? Because the, the code design in some cases does depend critically on the error rate that you want to design for. I said, so what, what do you want, 10 to the minus 5? He said, well, that, that's probably not good enough. And I said, well, what about 10 to the minus 10? And he said, well, you know, these scientists, the, the physicists that work on these space programs, uh, uh, that may not be good enough for them. And, and I'd say, well, you know, kind of what, what do they want? I mean, what error rate are they looking for? And he'd come back and say, well, you know, they they really don't want any errors. <laughs> so, the, you know, but, but uh, so, you know, maybe 10 to the minus 5 isn't good enough for everybody. 10 to the minus 10, what happens with 10 to the minus 10 is, let's look at that uh, 8 PSK case again. Now it requires 16.8 dB instead of, what was it, 13.2 to get 10 to the minus 10 as opposed to 13.2 dB to get 10 to the minus 5. So it always, the, the more reliability you want, the more power it takes. And so in terms of this particular graph, if you flip from a 10 to the minus 5 requirement to a 10 to the minus 10 requirement, you're always going to move to the right in the sense that you're going to require more power. So that, that's not uh, anything that I'm going to spend much time on, but it does come up later in the talk in one particular instance that's interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay, so I guess I said that. So what had happened within the first 10 days, uh, or first 10 years of coding theory, or the first day of, of the genesis of coding theory? Well, uh, many of you may have heard of Hamming codes, so-called single error correcting Hamming codes, and these are a few. And basically there's Dick Hamming, who passed away a number of years ago, one of the early pioneers in, in coding theory. And the, the notation I'll use here, we use, for a block code, which is kind of the most common type of code, uh, it's denoted by two parameters, n and k, where n is the block length and k is the number of information symbols. Uh, and the rate of the code is k over n. So 3126 here means you have 26 information symbols. 
you basically add five parity symbols to it to get a block length of 31. And the rate is 26 over 31, which brings you uh, that, that factor, it, it brings you down to a bandwidth efficiency of around 1.7 or something like that rather than 2. So the fact that not all your bits are information bits, some of them are parity bits or redundant bits, means that there's a rate loss or a loss in bandwidth efficiency, but there's a gain in power efficiency compared to the uncoded case. So the, uh, well, one, one other point throughout the talk, if I indicate a particular code with a square, it means that hard decision demodulation is being used. This is something that those of you that uh, have studied communication systems would know what I mean by hard decision demodulators. You, you have a matched filter or something, you take a sample and you quantize it into a one or a zero. Okay, and then the decoder works on the ones and zeros. But you can also do soft demodulation, and it's known where you work with the uh, higher order quantization rather than binary quantization or unquantized values out of the matched filter, and that allows you to get better performance. We'll see that as we move along. Uh, so the coding gain here is just a, a little over 1 dB. So we bought a dB at the expense of some loss in bandwidth efficiency. So that was kind of what the early, uh, the, the very earliest codes that were designed were able to do. And no, notice there's still a lot of room before we get over to the capacity bound. There's a famous Golay code. Marcel Golay was a Swiss mathematician that invented this triple error correcting code. It's the version here, a couple versions of it is a rate 12 over 24. So it loses half the bandwidth efficiency compared to uncoded modulation, but there's a 2 dB coding gain. So you may notice that throughout the first part of the talk, we're always going to be giving up bandwidth efficiency to gain coding, to gain power efficiency. And that was the reason that in the early days, most applications of channel coding were to uh, pro problems where there was plenty of bandwidth available, like space and satellite communication or, or military communication. Okay, the, the military, always, they have all the bandwidth they want, okay? And uh, if it, it also NASA, the government, they, they get all the bandwidth they want. So uh, most of the applications, the early days of coding were to these kind of somewhat non commercial not, not necessarily commercial applications where bandwidth was plentiful because you had to give up bandwidth to get uh, power gain. Okay, so there was a, a, another reed muller code that came in at that time. I just highlight that. We'll, we'll see that again uh, later. It's a very low rate code with a fairly modest amount of coding gain. Say, so why would we be interested in that? Well, we'll see later. Uh, and then, of course, at 10 to the minus 10, this is just to point out again, uh, the coding gain for the Gole code at 10 to the minus 10 is, is up to about 2.5 dB because the uncoded performance requires, but both the uncoded and the coded performance require more power, but there's a net gain for the code. So the coding gain is about half a dB larger at 10 to the minus 10 than it is at 10 to the minus 5. And this is just typical. I mean, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm not going to dwell on the 10 to the minus 10 stuff too, too much. Well, the first decade, that was, th those were some of the major advances. Now we move ahead to another decade. And there were more algebraic code designs. Another, another uh, thing that you'll notice as we move through the talk is that as the, as the uh, code points that we give here, uh, they'll tend to move closer to capacity, of course, that's progress. Uh, but the block lengths will get longer. And of course, Shan Shannon's results, to get all the way to capacity, you have to let the block length get asymptotically large, really big block lengths. So the reason that I'm showing in the beginning is short block lengths, it's, it's a, it was a technological reason. It's not, in theory, 
you could get things that would operate way over here. But in practice, to try to implement them with something practical, so the, the points I'm showing here are things that were considered practical that people could actually build and that wound up in systems. And it just, because of the technology in the 60s, it wasn't practical to design codes with extremely large block lengths. So the block lengths were somewhat limited and in practice, and these are some of the uh, Elwin Burlakamp, Tadalkas, Sami, Shu Lin, Wes Peterson, people who worked a lot on these algebraic designs, BCH codes, quadratic residue codes, which were, they had decoding algorithms which were simpler in the sense that they could allow the implementation of uh, in the, uh, about a decade later for use in compact disks, and they're still used today in that application as well as many other applications. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I guess I have indicated that. Also, in the 60s, convolutional codes were really developed in the 50s, but they really weren't employed any place until the 60s uh, satellite communication. A couple, these are just a couple of communication satellites that were put up in the 60s. Peter Elias at MIT and Jim Massey, also at MIT and then at Notre Dame, were two of the people most responsible for developing convolutional codes. The notation for convolutional codes includes a third symbol. Rather than an N and a K like block codes, it includes an M, which is an encoder memory or sometimes called a constraint length. So the, the convolutional codes differ from the block codes in the sense that there's memory from block to block. So the, in terms of uh, implementation, you can think of uh, a block code being implemented with a, a combinatorial circuit, whereas a convolutional code gets implemented with a sequential circuit. Okay, and uh, now here, I, I showed this Reed Muller code, and a space mission which was launched in the late 60s, the Mariner mission, used that same code but with soft demodulation. Uh, otherwise, the nice thing about this code was it has a had a design which made it easy to do, to use soft outputs from the match filter, unquantized, rather than binary quantization, and that gains almost 2 dB in performance. So that's a nice, uh, people were realizing at this time that if somehow you could build design decoding algorithms which could take advantage of soft quantization out of the demodulator, uh, you would do much better in terms of performance. And this, this did make it somewhat difficult for codes which were constructed based on algebraic structure to compete because the algebraic structure, the, the BCH and the quadratic residue and some of those that I mentioned earlier, uh, were really designed to work with hard decisions. So if you, if you add soft demodulator decisions, then uh, it was difficult to use some of those algebraically based codes. So uh, they, in some sense, in practice, fell out of favor uh, a little bit in the, in the 70s, but not, not completely because they always had a nice uh, advantage in terms of implementation, the simplicity of the implementation. Now also during uh, the 60s, uh, Bob Gallagher at MIT invented low-density parity check codes, and I'm just Th those were also based on soft decisions, and I, I uh, indicate here uh, uh, the modern-day low-density parity check codes can essentially get over to capacity. This is the length of code, 504, that Bob was able to implement on a computer, simulate, in, uh, in the early 60s. So that's what was achievable at that point. The, the, the other even though this is a block code, there's a couple of other symbols here indicating it's a so-called low-density parity check code, so J and K are kind of numbers that indicate the density of the parity check matrix. So those of you that have had a little exposure to coding theory probably know what I'm talking about, should know what I'm talking about. Those of you that don't, it won't matter too much. Okay, so uh, that, those are just parameters. So a 6 dB coding gain at that time was pretty impressive, but the implementation complexity of these codes was thought to be high at the time. 
say more about that later. Uh, the convolutional code with, and these, these are all people that worked on uh, convolutional codes, Bob Fano, Camille Zagangroff in Russia, Fred Jelinek at IBM. I mean, the, these guys did the decoding algorithm kind of independently at the same time. Erwin Jacobs, who went on to found Qualcomm, uh, was originally a researcher in sequential decoding. And a guy from Sweden, Rolf Johannesson, who also did a lot of work in this area. So these are, these are so-called large memory or large constraint length convolutional codes. This was, uh, this was launched in a pioneer space mission in the late 60s. And the coding gain was impressive of the order of 6 dB. And uh, th this is what got people thinking. It's right about at the cutoff rate bound. And people thought, well, it's going to be really hard to get beyond that cutoff rate bound. And actually, for another, it took another 25 years, basically, before people really did get beyond the cutoff rate bound. So it was almost 7 dB coding gain. So another decade goes by, and uh, one of the other co-founders of Qualcomm, Andrew Viterbi, uh, developed the so-called Viterbi algorithm for decoding short constraint length convolutional codes. Uh, the algorithm only works with short constraint lengths, but it's a maximum likelihood decoding algorithm. None of these other algorithms decoding methods that I've referred to here are maximum likelihood. They're suboptimum. This one was actually optimum, and it could take advantage of soft demodulator decisions. So even though the coding gains were not as big as, say, these long constraint length convolutional codes, there were implementation advantages for these shorter constraint length codes that made them quite attractive in practice. And these kind of short constraint length codes were wound up being adopted in a lot of standards, uh, NASA standards as well as other standards. Uh, there was also something called a a hybrid decoding scheme based on sequential decoding that Fred Jelinek had brought in at that time. I won't dwell too much on that. So the, the way these short constraint length convolutional codes were used is they were used in a, in a concatenation, a combination of two codes. Uh, Dave Forney at MIT, and a lot of the early work, as you've maybe heard me say so far, was done at MIT in coding theory. Uh, Dave developed the idea of a concatenated code, just a combination of two codes. A short uh, code, for example, a short constraint length convolutional code, followed by a more powerful code, uh, which would be like an example for the Voyager space mission, a uh, Reed Solomon code. Uh, and this, wound, this particular combination wound, wound up being adopted as a CCSDS standard by NASA and also the European Space Agency and used in a lot of different applications also, not just in space or satellite. Again, kind of stuck around the cutoff rate in terms of performance and still a few dB away from capacity. Well, okay. Now, remember I said earlier, everything, everything, all of these gains cost bandwidth efficiency. Again, in the, in the, in the mid-70s, Gottfried Ungerbeck from IBM developed a way of combining coding with modulation. And this particular example here combined a, a rate two-thirds convolutional code with memory two, a very simple short constraint length convolutional code, with eight PSK modulation. All of these others basically are based on BPSK, in such a way that you get a coding gain without bandwidth expansion. So this was called trellis-coded modulation. And, basic, and Hideki Amai in Japan, at roughly the same time, developed a similar but different scheme called multi-level coding, uh, which accomplished the same, uh, the same goal is to provide a gain in power efficiency without a loss of bandwidth efficiency. Otherwise, what you did in, 
in addition to adding your redundant bits, your parity bits, is you expanded the size of the signal set, say from QPSK to 8PSK. And that allowed you to recapture your, your uh, bandwidth efficiency loss and maintain a power efficiency gain. So these very simple codes had a coding gain of about 2.5 dB with no penalty in uh, bandwidth efficiency. And the, the simplest multi-level scheme also did, uh, had a coding gain without any loss in bandwidth efficiency. Okay, and we hop ahead another decade. Now what happened, we'll see here in a minute. Uh, I mean, these, these are some soft decision uh, application of some soft demodulator decision to some uh, earlier codes, uh, convolutional codes that were done at that time. There, then there was the development of a so-called big Viterbi decoder by Oliver Collins at JPL. Uh, it used a constraint length 14. Now, the Viterbi decoder, as I said earlier, was limited to short constraint lengths in practice you couldn't go beyond it, constraint length seven or eight, and that's what really per determines the performance of a convolutional code. The more constraint length you have, the better. Oliver was able to use, to implement a decoder using some very clever VLSI design techniques to be able to implement a constraint length 14 code, convolutional code with a Viterbi decoder. They called it for obvious reasons, the big Viterbi decoder. And it hung in there at around the cutoff rate or actually a little better. And then if you concatenated that with the Reed-Solomon code, you actually went, this was the Galileo mission which was launched in the 80s. Bob McLeese at JPL was Oliver's advisor. Uh, had a lot to do with the design of this system. So there was some progress in getting beyond cutoff rate with complex designs that would not be commercially competitive because of the cost of developing these VLSI chips, but uh, could certainly be used in things like deep space. Okay, and then, but in this decade, most of the effort was towards this, this more bandwidth efficient coding, and expanding on Ungerbeck and Imai's ideas. So there, there were a number of uh, additional developments there using more complex codes. You get more coding gain. You could go up to higher bandwidth efficiencies by using, uh, expanding the larger order signal sets, larger, larger modulation alphabets. Uh, you could get fractional bandwidth efficiencies. This is uh, a little obscure for the non-expert, but uh, you could essentially fill in uh, the picture here, and instead of getting within a few dB of capacity down here in the low rate or, or uh, <clears throat> high bandwidth expansion area, do the same thing at higher bandwidth efficiencies. So High-speed modems were the obvious application of this kind of work, and not only application, the motivation for this kind of work. Lee Fong Wei at Bell Labs uh, was a big contributor to this work. Uh, Rob Calderbank and Neil Sloan also at Bell Labs. Of course, Bell Labs was very interested in developing high-speed modem technology. So the, uh, one of the first standards was the V.32 standard, uh, it was a so-called rotational invariant code. One of the things you had to do with trellis-coded modulation was worry about rotations of the phase uh, angle, and so you could lock onto the, the receiver could lock onto the correct phase. Uh, so it was a phase synchronization issue. And the V.32 standard code achieved about a 3.5 dB coding gain with, again, no loss in bandwidth efficiency compared to uncoded 16 QAM, so operating at four bits per signal. Uh, and then there were even, uh, oh, okay, so that, that, those were, that, that was probably the main focus in the, in, the, in, the, in the 80s. And then in the 90s, uh, 
No, oh, did anything come up? Yeah, okay. Well, there were some additional work research-wise on, well, I, I'm just highlighting here some of the standard codes, cellular systems that employed, again, short constraint length convolutional codes with soft decision Viterbi decoding. Very practical, very simple to implement in handsets and things like that. So these became popular for different cellular applications and still, still are today. Then there was also a lot of work, remember I said how the algebraic designs had kind of fallen out of favor? I mean the, the convolutional codes and the uh, sequential decoding and Viterbi decoding and, and things like this were, were kind of taking over because of their ability to exploit soft decisions. But there were a number of people who worked on these uh, algebraic designs and developed soft decision decoding algorithms for them, which allowed them to be more competitive with these other uh, types of designs. Shu Lin did a, a lot of work in that area. Jack Wolf uh, recently passed away, for those of you that might follow coding theory people. Frank Shashang, uh, Mark Fasorier, uh, and Alex Vardy and and Ralph Cutter, uh, I'm talking about too many people that have passed away here. Ralph also passed away recently, but anyway, that's a, uh, not relevant to the, to the uh, terrific work they did on these codes. Uh, developed soft decision decoding methods for Reed Solomon codes, and uh, some additional work has been done by Jin Miao here on uh, implementation, VLSI implementation of some of these. Uh, algorithms which makes them really competitive with some of the previous soft decision designs that relied more on convolutional codes. Uh, but then in, in, in the mid-decade, three French guys, uh, main one, Baru, wasn't even a coding theorist. This happens all the time, you know, you're working in a particular area and you're so fo you have certain assumptions built in, which you never question, and you're so focused on what you can do given those assumptions, they just took a completely fresh view and were able all of a sudden with a, a s relatively simple design to get way beyond cutoff rate and close to capacity, something called a turbo code. Uh, it, it involves uh, pseudo-random interleaving of two simple short constraint length convolutional codes and an iterative decoding method. Uh, and many people in the field did not believe this result. They know how hard it was to get this stuff and this was much simpler in terms of decoding than trying to decode these things and many people felt I remember uh, being at a conference shortly after this was introduced, within a month, and one of the guys who had heard their talk, I hadn't been at the ICC in 1993 that year, comes up to me and tells me about it, and he says, I say it can't be true, and he said, yeah, it can't be true, there's got to be a mistake. Well, so everybody for the next year, coding people, worked on trying to find the mistake, and in the information theory symposium the following year in 1994, people came along and everybody came with the same conclusion. It wasn't a mistake, they were right. So we had, it was a nice shot in the arm for coding theory. Uh, this previous very complex Galileo scheme was about 2 dB short of capacity. This turbo was a whole dB better with much simpler uh, design. So it was quite exciting, and again, if you make the code longer, then you can get closer to capacity. It wasn't a problem to make these codes long because the complexity only varied linearly with block length. So you could go to a longer one here, 65,000, half a dB from capacity. Uh, and of course, if it's shorter, you're further away again, but the, the point here is that with a lot of these other designs, to get the length that you need to get closer to capacity, the complexity would grow 
polynomially or exponentially in some cases, whereas with this design, the complexity only grow linear, grows linearly. So you win. And at, the, at, a, at roughly the same time, or shortly after turbo codes, people realized that they had a lot in common with these old LDPC codes that Gallagher had developed. And people re realized that they were kind of a variation on the same theme. Michael Tanner was somebody at UC Santa Cruz who had kept the Gallagher flame alive without too many people listening for all these intervening years. And then people all of a sudden go back and discover Gallagher's work and Tanner's work uh, at about this time after the introduction of turbo codes. So the LDPCs at this time you could easily get within a dB and a half of capacity or better. It just depended on the parameters you chose. Again, the complexity is linear in block length. So that was really exciting. Joachim Hagenauer, he was the guy, by the way, that said it can't be true. Uh, he did, he set the record at the time with a so called turbo hamming code at a very high rate, which got within, uh, don't I have that listed here? Oh, yeah, 0 0.27 dB. So a quarter of a dB away from capacity. So we're almost there, essentially there, with these new designs. So it was, it was very nice. For people working in coding theory, it keeps some of us employed for a few more years, get a few more grants coming in to study these things. Uh, now, what about the 10 to the minus 10? Okay. You remember that long turbo code, which was a half a dB for capacity? Well, if you, if you say, what does it do at 10 to the minus 10? It goes way back in the weeds with some of those old short designs almost 6 dB from capacity, it loses over 5 dB in trying to go from 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 10. So there was, there, there is, there was a flaw with these things. This is, the, this, again, you have to be somewhat of a coding theorist to have heard of this, the so-called error floor problem of turbo codes. So they do extremely well at moderate error rates, they do poorly at high error rates something called an error floor if you look at the bit error rate curve for these things. The LDPC codes, at least the regular ones of Gallagher's original construction, their loss in going from 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 10 is about a quarter dB. So they had a, a huge advantage over turbo codes in terms of applications that require extremely low error rates. So the focus has changed in the last 10 years away from turbo codes more towards LDPCs, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I'm going to skip some of these things. That There were further advances in the bandwidth efficient range, Rajiv Roya, uh, now with Flareon, which is part of Qualcomm, did the design leading to the V.34 standard. Uh, all right, what about more recent times? Uh, I'm going to skip over that one. Uh, there were combinations of turbo codes with trellis coded modulation. Uh, otherwise, turbo coding doesn't just apply to binary modulation, you can use it in bandwidth efficient. Sergio Benedetto from Italy and Darius Divsilar from JPL uh, developed something they called parallel concatenated TCM. Uh, Johannes Huber from Germany developed a, the, the MI version, the multi-level version of bandwidth efficient coding combined with turbo codes. Uh, there were a number of people who worked on bit interleaved coded modulation, uh, Ezio Biglieri and Giuseppe Caire from Italy did the kind of the theoretical foundation, uh, a very simple way of applying turbo codes in bandwidth efficient and LDPCs in bandwidth efficient applications. Uh, Jim Ritzy here at Washington is also another person who's done work in that area, uh, quite a bit of work in that area. Uh, and, and then uh, 
again, with a, moving away from the turbo coating, the uh, Richardson and Urbanke, Tom Richardson and Rudy Urbanke, developed something called an irregular LDPC code design, which fiddling with the density of the parity check matrix allows you essentially to get the capacity, 0 0.0045 dB. Uh, so this was uh, basically saying we're there, we've done what Shannon said we ought to be able to do. Uh, of course, that was an extremely 10 million bit block length, and for standard applications, for implementation reasons, uh, sometimes quasi-cyclic designs, shorter quasi-cyclic designs, also of the LDPC variety, are desired and there's a number of applications which are uh, developing standards based on these quasi-cyclic LDPC codes. Michael Tanner and Shu Lin are among many who have contributed in that area. Very recently, since 2008 actually, I need a 2018 slide probably, Polar Codes by, introduced by Erdal Erikan is a, a new class of capacity achieving codes that is still a very hot research topic in terms of trying to develop uh, uh, practical decoding methods for these codes, but a very exciting area of research. And another one which gets very close to capacity, uh, low density parity check convolutional codes are so-called spatially coupled codes. And again, many people working on this right now include Camille Zagangroff started the ball rolling about 10 years ago, and one of his PhD students, Mikhail Lentmeyer, has uh, done a lot of work on that recently. So these are so-called terminated low-density parity check convolutional codes. These last two topics are kind of the current research areas in coding, channel coding theory uh, today. Now, do we have five minutes for a little fun? Okay, all right. So I did the, I gave a version of this talk uh, three years ago in, uh, at an informa uh, turbo coding conference in Lausanne, Switzerland. And it was right before our election. So I thought, well, before I would give that talk, I should see if I could interview the candidates and find out what they thought about coding theory and what kind of, what codes were their favorite codes. Okay, so it took me some time, but I started with the current, the, the, the president at that time, Bush, and uh, I said, what's your favorite code? And he said, well, you know, I, I, like, I like this one. And I said, <laughs> George, I said, that's, that's not even coding, that's uncoded. Why, I mean, why, why wouldn't you use coding? And he said, well, because coding gets you closer to the <laughs> axes of evil. Okay, so that was, his, that was his view. He didn't want to get, he didn't want to approach those things. Now, Hillary, of course, was a candidate then and, and maybe in the future. Uh, and she said, oh, I like this, this Richardson and Urbanke irregular low density parity check code. And I said, well, okay, that's a great code. Why, why did you choose that one? And she said, because my race with Obama was asymptotically close, 0 0.0045 dB. So that was, her, that was her preference. Then I, you know, went to the vice presidential candidate at that time. Now he's vice president. And uh, he said, well, I, I, you know, I, I like this one. And I said, well, <laughs> that's bandwidth efficiency zero, no rate. I said, it's not really doesn't accomplish anything. He said, well, when I speak, there's <laughs> no information content anyway. So, okay, fair enough. Uh, then I went to the other vice presidential candidate at, at that time, uh, Mrs. Palin, and she liked the polar code. Now, uh, this is fudged a little bit, of course, because polar codes weren't introduced until about a year later. But it, 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 it helps with the presentation. I, wh why do you like the polar code? Well, 
She said, I'm from Alaska, you betcha. I love those cute little polar coats. So that was her choice. And uh, the, the presidential candidate on the other side this, this time, last time was, was uh, Senator McCain. And I asked him, what's his favorite coat? And he said, well, this. <laughs> and I said, that? I, 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 I said, you know, you've got a, uh, a loss in bandwidth efficiency and a loss in power efficiency. <laughs> why, would you, why would you want that? He said, well, he says, I'm a real conservative. And he said, look how far to the right I am. So he basically just wanted something way off the screen to the right. Or at least he wanted to convince people that he was way off the screen to, to the right. Okay, and then of course I went to candidate Obama at that time, uh, now President Obama, and he picked this one. And I said, well, I, Barack, I said, that's fine, but you know, you can't do that. I said, yeah, that's, that's, Shannon said that that's impossible. You can't go beyond this capacity bound. And he said, Change, baby, change. That was the, and he even, even gave me a reference, his, his book there. So I guess I had to accept that, you know. Uh, now, so I've updated this a little bit. Okay, so I got to, uh, I didn't get a chance to get a hold of everybody, but I, a few of them I did. I got Rick Perry here. Now it's all, you know, there's no Democrats running, so I, I can't uh, make fun of them. Uh, but Rick here said, uh, he just said, what did Bush like? And I said, well, that one. And he said, me too. Ah, that, that, oh, that's, that was, the me too was not supposed to pop up until the next one. Okay, so anyway. Uh, then uh, Mrs. Bachman also uh, is a candidate, and I said, what, what code did you like? And she said, well, I kind of like this Reed Solomon 255-223 code to soft decision. Said, okay, why do you like that? She said, well, we need more women in coding theory. She said, this is the only woman I saw in your whole presentation. So then I got, uh, now unfortunately, I did this before yesterday. I, I could have, I if I had taken advantage of yesterday's news, we probably could have had it better. I don't, I don't want to be too tough on people, though. So Herman Cain uh, liked this uh, spatially coupled code because, as I said before, these are so-called terminated versions of the low-density parity check codes. And he said, the Hermanator likes to terminate. So, Okay. And, oh, there is one more. I can't forget uh, Ron Paul. And... Uh, I asked him, what's your favorite code? He said, I don't have one. He said, I'm going to eliminate the Department of Education so we won't need this kind of research anymore. <laughs> okay, so enough for the fun part. I'm, well, I'm, I'm actually kind of almost on time. So these are what I view as in the first six days of the creation of coding theory, or the first 60 years, kind of the, the, the major themes that have gone throughout this field, the algebraic coding in the beginning, based on algebraic structure, then the convolutional codes with shift register implementations, the Viterbi algorithm and the ability to do maximum likelihood decoding, uh, trellis coded modulation for bandwidth efficiency, soft decision decoding of block codes, uh, w uh, maybe algebraically constructed block codes, which was not possible in the beginning. Turbo codes and iterative decoding, which really revolutionized the field again and led us to capacity, which we actually achieved by using LDPC codes and more generally codes based on graphs. And then the more recent work on polar codes and spatially coupled codes, which are spatially coupled codes are really the, the uh, Cadillac version of LDPC codes, and polar codes are a, a little different variety. So this is just a collage of some of the various contributors uh, to the field. That's what I used to look like there. Uh, and the seventh day, most people rest, but not engineers or computer scientists or mathematicians. 
So these are just some of the issues that I see uh, as keeping this field alive uh, for further research. There's a number of kind of modern code designs. Uh, Space-time codes, I never mentioned those. Uh, So-called rateless codes for internet type applications. That's another exciting more recent application of this kind of work. And, and then these are some of the various application areas. Uh, flash memories is getting to be a hot application for coding and even quantum coding and optical communication where they require extremely low decoded error rates, which means you better worry about that error floor that I talked about earlier. And then there's a lot of system design issues, somewhat more practical issues, but that have to be solved in terms of making things actually work in a real system. So coding with a delay constraint, for example. When you have infinite block length, you have infinite delay. So there's the issue of how well you can do with finite delay constraints and various other issues here. So I will, uh, I guess these slides are going to be posted so you could peruse this slide if you're interested at your leisure. So that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Um, uh, I have to do some research on model level coding. And some model level coding. And some people said just model level coding can fit the EIC. And from the information point of view, yeah, the question is about multi-level coding uh, compared to BICM, and you're right. I mean, in principle, multi-level coding, BICM is simple. Oh, you, you're complaining about the point I showed for multi-level, yeah. I mean, you're right, but okay, the, again, the question was about the practical advantages of multi-level, and it sounds like you know more about this than I do. I think you're right in that if you use multi-level coding, you can, I think you're saying you can get by with shorter block lengths in the component codes than you would have to use to get the same performance with BICM, say, for example. And that does make sense to me. I think that's true, and uh, which leads to less complexity. The, the multi-level point I had up there was the, the very earliest TCM and multi-level designs were just four-state or two-state designs. And I just picked the perf I, I put the performance of those up there. But I wasn't necessarily in any of these trying to, trying to pick the, the best, the point which represents the best performance of a given system or something like this. So I, I think the, I, I have no argument with the points you made about multi-level coding. Well, the DVD standard, they just use the multi-level, two-level two multi-level, just yeah. use the convolution code. Yeah. But when you, you want to use the LPPC code, because when you show through this, it will have a more possibility to cost the cycle. So for which level it will decrease the the, the performance. So my question is, what's the real, how to really implement the multi-level code just combined with some stuff? Well, okay, again, again, the question was had to do with what I would say was some detailed question about implementation of multi-level code. And the answer is, we should talk about that after lunch, if you're going to be around. Okay, because, uh, yeah, there's lots of details involved in how to best design these bandwidth efficient coding schemes, multi-level, TCM, BICM, and implementation complexity is of prime importance. So I'd be happy to chat with you later. Like I say, you sound like you know more about it than I do, so I'd be interested in chatting to you later about that, and maybe I can learn something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so over the summer, there's this paper in JSAC that got published where they talked about coupling the energy it takes to actually decode your code, and also it takes to actually transmit your code. So they included that within their error bound. 
So do you see that as kind of a new valid angle for you to take coding research? Because they came up with a model for how much power it takes for your, say, LDC circuit. Yeah. OK, the question was having to do with, uh, uh, they, they asked me to repeat the question. So uh, a paper that occurred appeared in JSAC earlier this year about the actual power consumption in the decoding computation and the encoding computation and should that be figured into the calculation here of what's the best code and all this kind of stuff, as well as the power required to transmit? And that was probably Anant Sahai's paper. Was that? Yeah, yeah. So Anant Sahai is a, is a uh, professor at Berkeley who has popularized this view. I like it a lot. It, it's going to change all the graphs, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, uh, but, but basically, he's saying, look, if you're going to count, you're going to talk about power efficiency, EB over N0, you can't just worry about the transmitted power. You, I mean, it takes power to the signal processing at the encoder and the decoder take, take power. And, and that should be figured in also. So, in some sense, it's a way of, of including complexity, computational complexity, into the power calculation. So the way people do it now is we compare based on transmitted or received power, and then we say, oh, yeah, but the, this algorithm is more complex than this algorithm or less complex than the other algorithm. It's, it's a way of trying to integrate those in one, and I think it's a very interesting direction of research. I've talked to Anand about it, and uh, I think he's on to something there, and I think that in the end, this is what, you know, a system designer is worried about total power consumption in some sense, so that view uh, is, is probably one that's going to gain some credence, but with a lot of these things, it, it's, it probably take time. Yeah. But I'd say for for somebody looking to do research in this area, that's an interesting thing to, to consider because it's, it's not as well tread as some of the other areas. So, is this Summit? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> so, looking beyond the eight days, I mean, uh, if you leave the AWGN channels, in, you, know, you mentioned some of the interference channels. Yeah. Uh, particularly with the emphasis on, say, uh, internet type dissemination. Yeah. You know, broadcasting moving yeah. to the internet, yeah. streaming type applications. Yeah. Fundamentally, do you see a, a revival of erasure type channels, carry coding? You know, you mentioned some of these ideas, and if you're looking looking ahead, do you see that as a as a major theme for? Yeah, I mean, the, so the the question was about. Uh, uh, more internet applications and network applications, and would that uh, lead to a revival of interest in, say, erasure coding or the erasure channel? And the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean that that is the point. I mean these now this is this has been. I mean these guys did this work. Uh, back in the late 90s, so it's been around for a while, and it's, it's been a very hot topic. A lot of the design issues are the same as designing good LDPC codes for the Gaussian channel, but, but some, some are different. And the, the applications, obviously, kind of internet and uh, network type applications. I have my last PhD student working on this topic, and I just gave a talk on it last week at uh, the Information Theory Workshop in Brazil. But, uh, I mean, this, this clearly, and, and that, because of the way the different layers of the Internet is designed, oftentimes what you're dealing with is, rather than errors on the channel, you're dealing with erasures. So codes that are designed to handle erasures are becoming a more uh, topical subject in, in the literature, and I, I see that continuing, yeah, I mean, that's, there's all, there's all these different directions that coding theory is moving in, and of course, that's one of the, the main ones. Yeah. I mean, the, Gauss, the, 
the standard Gaussian channel problem is pretty much solved. I mean, we know how to do it. Now, I'm still working on trying to find the best combination of complexity and performance and stuff like that, but younger people should be working on, on problems with uh, more applications, say, in, in networking and in, internet and things like that, wireless, et cetera, different, different models. Yeah. So I'm really interested in the, like the problem error floor. Yeah. So actually, it's a kind of belief that the error floor is caused by the decoding algorithm. Yeah. True. So partly, partly, yes. and also the code itself, right? Yeah. So there are two ways to deal with that, like to design better code or to design better algorithm. Right. So, but is it? So I'm just uh, curious about whether it is possible to completely completely uh, eradicate this problem in the future. I mean, no matter how people do it, they still have just can alleviate the problem, but cannot totally solve the problem. Well, OK, the question was about this error floor issue that I indicated, and comment was made that the appearance of an error floor in a particular design depends both on the code and also on the decoder, how you design the decoder. And if it was possible in, to, to really get rid of this problem or lay this problem to rest, uh, that this is, I think, the major remaining problem in designing codes for the Gaussian channel, and that there's no issue as to how, do you, how you get to capacity essentially at, at 10 to the minus 5 error rate. But when you go to the lower error rates, the, and to get close to capacity you need, you need really long codes. So to use maximum likelihood decoding is, is still too complex. I mean these belief propagation and iterative decoding algorithms are all suboptimum. And they have, there are artifacts in those, in those algorithms that cause this error floor as well as maybe problems in the code design. Uh, irregular LDPCs, for example. Most irregular LDPCs have a problem with the code design that is going to give you an error floor regardless of the decoding algorithm. And there may be additional problems with the decoding algorithm, absorbing sets and things like that. One, one of the things I like about these spatially coupled codes is that they, at least from the code design point of view, they're not, they're not subject to error floor. They have large minimum distances and things like this. It'd still be a problem with regard to, uh, so they're, they're kind of a, uh, if you haven't followed them, they're kind of a hybrid between regular and irregular. But they, uh, uh, they, they still, of course, would be a, pot a potential problem with, with the decoding algorithm and whether you're going to have absorbing sets or trapping sets and things like that. But, but the code design is more solid in that regard than, than typical irregular designs. So yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I think, of the remaining problems in kind of classical code design, this, because some, many of these applications, excuse me, like storage, if, uh, flash memories or other kinds of storage, and optical, that they're not going to be happy with 10 to the minus 5 error rates. You really have to, and of course, you can't really simulate down that far, so you have to have some analytical tools that can guarantee performance at 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 15 or whatever. Or like that NASA guy said, uh, we just don't want any errors. Okay, I have one last question. So there are different codes developed in the past, like more than 50 years, from BCH to Ray Solomon to uh, uh, the uh, convolutional code and polar code, etc. So probably in those early days, people were using pure mathematical derivation to develop new codes. And now high-speed computing or dedicated hardware are available. So do you think the availability of this high-speed computation changed the way people are developing new codes? What does it help? Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I don't have to repeat that question because you're on mic. But uh, so the answer, again, I'm answering all these questions with yes. 
uh, it's true that the early days of coding theory, the code designs were based on some kind of mathematical structure. Many of the, many of the people who worked in coding in the early days were mathematicians. So Golay was a mathematician. Uh, Bose and Chowdhury, Oakwin, I think they were all mathematicians. Uh, so there were, and because you needed a mathematical structure to be able to guarantee performance at a certain level. Now, clearly, over the years, computer searches for good codes became easier to do. I actually, my PhD thesis, I think I was one of the first people who, you know, we took the easy way out. We just, we didn't know enough mathematics, so we just, computers were good enough at that time to do some <coughs> rudimentary <coughs> code searches. But, you know, most of the, most of the code designs now, yeah, I, I, the irregular LDPC codes are a good example. They're done by doing uh, d d density evolution, it's very computationally intensive, but, but you know, who cares? You can, you, you get a good code out of it and you only have to do it once. So, so there is probably less emphasis on mathematical structure uh, from the point of view of code design now. It's still important with regard to decoder design or decoding complexity. Otherwise, they, if, like I mentioned, the quasi-cyclic codes. Everybody that wants to implement an LDPC code and a standard, most of them want a quasi-cyclic because it has an algebraic structure which gives a modular, you know this, I guess, a modularity to the, uh, to the VLSI designer makes it easier to design the, the decoder that way. So I think that that's, so, so both, are, both are still important, but the, tra the, the tendency is to go more towards the computer-based designs, code designs. Okay, thank you so much for your nice talk. Okay.